Well, this is a, a very actual topic. I saw there are several sessions and talks to today uh, and, and uh, regarding Go routine as well. Uh, it's always a, a very hot and interesting topic, and it's actually the main reason why a lot of us has, uh, have chosen to, to adopt Go as a programming language and, and to build our platforms. So this is me. I go for rise myself during Ashley and Matt's talk. Found it's very simple. All, all I need is one object there. And so it's a lightweight gopher. And I actually like it. So I work for Workday, just introducing quickly. Uh, Workday is a, provides a cloud application, enterprise cloud applications, uh, specialized in financials, uh, human resources management, analytics, professional service automation, and the student student higher education in general. Workday is also uh, releasing its own platform for development purposes for partners and people who want to integrate better to highly scalable uh, enterprise applications. A few of the customers and the most, well, I guess, notable customers that you may recognize. And Workday is number one, uh, best places to work. Uh, and I guess that's probably a the reason why, why so, yeah. Free avocados, cool people, and I guess I, I'm the negative of, of that view there. And uh, so, uh, in general, when we are implementing a, an application, a system, and developing it towards uh, an implementation on our backend system, so we're talking about deploying a new application in, uh, in a set of, cluster, of clusters composed of hundreds or thousands of servers. The first question that comes from the people involved in that process is, how will you impact my other applications? How will you impact customer systems, production systems that have to be reliable? And this is a picture that would make it easy for everyone to understand. This is my process. And that's your process. Do not mess up with it. We have a very small footprint when we're running your system. And we want to also offer a, a view like this. This is the green. The green bars are showing how I believe, how we benchmarked our systems regarding CPU, memory, network utilization, and disk I.O. This makes it clear people will evaluate and say, well, that sounds pretty good. Let's, let's go ahead, and I'll, I'll be very glad to deploy your application, given no impact. So Go offers, in a way, we have, there's another type of impact, of course, which we, we all know is the fact that Go compiles into a single executable. We are not depending on libraries, Python or, or Ruby gems or whatsoever, and that's already a positive side. The modularity of, of, the, of the, the process is important, but the resource utilization is an aspect that is not so evident. It's an, object that, it's an aspect that we have to drill in, analyze, benchmark, and be able to offer a view like that. So, uh, go routines. And uh, rarely you'll find a Go application that does not use Go routines. And, still very possible. We're talking about a single task, a sequential processing. But let's define a Go routine. And obviously, we'll go to Wikipedia. So it's a primary concurrent construct, a type of lightweight process. So it's a prefix with the, 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 the word Go. And then current implementations, where we're talking in general about Linux, and modern operating systems, uh, we have uh, the Go routine distributed, or you know, the instructions uh, coordinated towards the execution of threads. And we're happy with that. That's an interesting proposal, but how do we understand that? So this is, uh, in this diagram, we are seeing how our physical memory which is on the top, is uh, shared through memory spaces that are owned by the process. So each process has a direct 
memory space, which is absolutely independent from another process. Processes may operate through threads. And the threads are coordinated through the OS scheduler towards the different cores, the different processors. So obviously today we have an average of 16, 32 cores per server, or even on our laptops or, or mobile devices. So we have the ability here to execute concurrently processes. And there is a black box which is offered by the operating system that is scheduling and coordinating how do we get our instructions in the process to be mapped and, uh, and executed in that processor. But when we talk about Go routines, if that process is now a Go routine, and let's visualize four threads around it, how does that Go routine end up in a processor? Well, first of all, how we define that we have four threads here is coming, in general, as um, a Go max prox. Basically, it's defining what's the maximum number of processors that your, your application will have. It's a runtime parameter. You can set by environment variable, or you can change it at runtime. The advice here is not to change it. I believe since Go 1.5, this came up being mapped as the total number of cores in your system. So this defaults to that, and you, you'd better not change that. There are situations that it may benefit the impact of your process, of your Go application towards other systems, but uh, it's, I believe, highly not advisable. So, um, that, uh, so the Go routine through internal Go scheduler, a routine scheduler, will be mapped to one of the threads. As we spin more Go routines, each of them will be allocated to a different thread. And that's based on an algorithm, a criteria, where you try to balance homogeneously your executions, the instructions you want to end up mapped to your processor. And, uh, and there is a relation there between the thread, the OS scheduler, and the processor core. So one thread may end up on core number one, other threads on core number two, and so on. You will not know from an application point of view where your instruction is executing, where that Go routine is ending up to execute. If you dare to query your system when you are performing a high load of Go routines in your application, you may use that command with a ps-t on Linux and observe what is your command doing. So in that case, we have something very interesting. We, we have the same process ID happening there, and there's nothing wrong with that. All your threads are working for the same process. All your threads can access the memory space related to that process. What is different here is the SP ID, which is the thread ID. And each of that will be a different one. You have also different metrics of uh, time there as well. And uh, some sophistication that command will, will lead you to see the core as well. So this is how we want to visualize in general a system. A CPU composed of cores. If we have a process, And that process is sharing the execution of your system. That's never exclusive, unfortunately. We have to, to deal with internal operating systems processes and other applications we are supporting and cooperating with. But eventually, we are expanding our processing requirements to a certain level. So we are consuming the area of that, of that sphere is actually equivalent to how much processing I'm consuming that core. If I have a threaded model of execution, you would end up seeing another thread for the same process running on a different core. Up to a situation like this. 
So you are still, let's assume you're still increasing the load of your system, you're still expanding the amount of tasks you are trying to execute. And you all end up consuming even more memory, uh, pardon me, even more uh, CPU, even more processing requirements. So you occupy most of the resources uh, of your system. And that's an obvious problem. So what's happening at that point? Over time, over a task of time, and by task here you can imagine as instruction code, you are seeing that there is a context switch that will transition the instruction being executed. And over time, because you have more, a higher number of tasks to be executed, you end up having more context switching than the execution of your instruction. So this means that your application has slowed down, and you're slowing down everything else on the system. This is a command you can use on Linux that will allow you to see how many switches are occurring for your specific task. I find it, this, this output very interesting. It will also show you the runtime, the latency that, that is involved behind that specific task. So that's one of the ways you can analyze your applications if you have evidence that it's slowing down. So, as we mentioned before, a Go, a, um, a Go process is uh, composed of Go routines, and there's an internal routine scheduler involved in, in uh, elaborating the map between that and the operating system thread. So, we know that Go routines do affect the CPU utilization, within various cores. So your single executable that you always thought that it's a tiny little grain within your server is actually potentially occupying all cores. But it should not affect each other. So that's overall, we have a sort of isolation or, or an evident isolation, but an isolation that is not true regarding when we have situations of switching and when we have a situation of consuming the same resources. And we'll talk about resources uh, very shortly. So a single program, let's assume that it has a worker go routine, a single worker go routine that is looking to consume tasks, perform computation, and produce an output. So this is what happens. Over a certain amount of time, it was able to consume and compute. Let's say that you want to make it faster, you want to improve the performance of your application, you have requirements to expand the amount of tasks you want to proceed in a limited number of time. So you are going to allocate more Go routines to perform the same task. Obviously, there is some state and coordination regarding how do you share that job. That's an obvious matter. But through this approach, Things are going faster. Now you got excited and you say, let's, let's overuse this. This is awesome. It saved me three times the, the amount of time I needed before. So let's, let's put a hundred of those or a, a thousand of those. And this is what happens you reach the point from where you did not obtain a benefit. As we discussed before, uh, context switching and the, the mapping of your executions, instruction executions towards different threads has caused this. So given uh, this definition here, a vertical application scalability regards your ability to, within the same server, to increase the amount of computation. So if you want to do that for any process, 
let's not talk about a Go process here. Let's talk about a simple process that is executing sequentially an instruction, a set of instructions. You would want to have a process scheduler, and you want to be able to spin up more processes that the OS will allocate to different cores. Not you, but the OS will take care of that. Your own scheduler process is a process on its own. It will end up executed in a core. But when we're talking about Go routines, this vertical application scalability is already part of it. It is already part of the mechanisms of Go dealing with threads. The Go routines will be automatically uh, scheduled towards how do you share a thread and perform context switching. So in this, uh, in this aspect here, we are looking at threads related to the same Go process. So, so the blue circles represent the same Go process being executed over different cores, through different threads. If we do a Go do something task, we end up with more. And we end up allocating more uh, execution. So the, the green circles are representing Go routines. So for every one of that, uh, every time we spin, we could start visualizing things as in this fashion. But you reach your, let's say, you reach your optimal level of Go routines. You benchmark, you analyze, you trace, and you, you realize, OK, I found that I can deal to perform this task at 100 a level of 100 routines of workers. How do you perform something faster? So you have to go beyond that server. You have to go in a horizontal aspect of scalability as illustrator here. And for that purpose, you need a cluster scheduler at this time who is managing the distribution of jobs and the coordination of work. This cluster scheduler is also a process. It will end up you want to host it in a specific server, you may call it master, and you will have some worker agents on different servers who are participating in that coordination. And we reached horizontal scalability. And we reached the ability to visualize an application that eventually is distributed through, through a cluster in such a way. So we know that a single process where you have a thread level scalability, which we're in, in, our, in our context here, we are talking about Go, is based on lightweight executions. It does not scale beyond the server. But for a vertical scalability, where we have multiple processes per server, which is something we inherit naturally if we are uh, if you're operating with a Go application, we can deal with a larger number of processes. It dilutes the context of switching load from a single process. It does not necessarily uh, prevent a faster threaded model. So in this case, we are talking about creating uh, additional processes within the same server. As I said, this is a Go routine is, can, can, can allow you to perform actions on the same server. So if we are doing that for a Go application, we are not really benefiting any performance. We actually may be degrading it because there's an overhead of creating more processes, which could be avoided if we just operate with properly uh, with Go routines. But this stage here, the vertical scalability stage is a milestone for you to reach the horizontal scalability. When you are spinning more processes, you are already developing something that allows you to work on a horizontal fashion. So then we go to the horizontal scalability, which is about creating that master agent approach of distribution. And it, it offers you an unlimited depending on some capacity and, and, and state communication matters, but you can visualize it as an unlimited approach to obtain more computation. 
So resources, I believe I copied this for, probably Ashley was involved in this, uh, go for. So resources, uh, we talked here exclusively mostly about CPU resources. What about other resources? We have resources that are not so obvious. Some are, like CPU and store and memory, but we also have storage. We may have to access a database or a data store to obtain our information, our state. Uh, we may deal with networking, and we may be serving or, or reaching a web server for consuming or providing APIs. If we keep increasing Go routines that are performing actions towards those resources, we start consuming those resources. And we should know that there will be an impact on those resources. So we have a possibility here to limit our utilization of resources. So the question is, how do we limit the number of Go routines that I'm uh, using to, uh, to, to um, consume those resources? One approach is based on buffer channels. So as a simple example, on the right side, we are creating a buffer channel. When we acquire a number of a number of um, slots, and we are going to be releasing them gradually. So here's the acquire. We transmit an insignificant amount of data. It could be an empty struct, but here we are transmitting a zero, just an, an integer, so that we have the ability to, as a consumer, to, allo to request a certain number of um, a certain number of uh, semaphores. So it's a semaphore model, and it works very well. So this is one of the approaches that you could take. So when you're dealing with resources, you would like to have an architecture as such. Uh, you would have a dispatcher process that is able to create your Go routines. He is in charge of that part of orchestration from your application point of view. It communicates with a resource manager, which is another routine, obviously, and it will, that resource manager is able to observe the amount of resources that are available in the system. When the resources are sufficient, the dispatcher allows you to allocate more processing requirements, more Go routines. So let's give an example where you have a directory slash temp, and you want to limit the amount of files to be written there to 100. I just defined a resource, and I just defined my limit for that resource. So in this case, we'll have, we need a, a, a management process, a management routine that is able to analyze those resources and orchestrate the creation of tasks that are going to compute that. So how uh, you could define a resource is very simple. All you need is this interface is one of the examples. Uh, a get ID, so you know what is the name of the resource. You want to make sure that the implementers of that interface have an identification. You want to get a, a progress. You want to understand from a percentage point of view, from 0 to 100, how much I have left for those resources. You want to, you want to query if that is available, and that's a very important method. And you want to start the resource. By start, I mean to start observing that resource. So in this, in this approach, the sequence diagram for that translates into something like this. You have a start event. You have 
the start events allows your resource implementer to pull and observe those resources for a predetermined amount of time. The, actually, the start method passes the, the pooling frequency for that. And your, your dispatcher is able to observe through the ease available method if you can allocate your, your slaves, your, your routines. So in this case, we're observing here on this lower part that we have the number of files on that directory from 20 and 35, and there are other things right into that directory. You can imagine that as a database, for instance. And we are okay up to the point where it's number 94. At that point, we are still, know, we are still aware that we can still create resources. But at one point, your resources are exceeding your limit, and let's see what happens. The next time you ask is available, you know that you cannot. There are in, in that red box on the upper right corner, it will be noted that you have uh, no interactions to create Go routines. But there's something wrong here as well. Between 105 and 133, you could still make uh, a, a dispatch Go routines in this yellow area here. So in this case, of course, this depends on your resolution or your polling frequency. So what you are doing here is creating an estimate. Your calculation of how you define your polling frequency is important to define that, that estimate uh, on how often you expect that. Obviously, that results into a, a linear approach, but in your rule here, you would define a limit that satisfies your expected amount of transactions during that time, right? Why don't we just query the resource for every is available uh, call? And the reason is it's sometimes expensive to query resources. If you're processing thousands or hundreds of thousands of transactions per minute, you will not be querying every time you want to uh, perform an action towards it. So you need a, a, a proper statistical state of, of that uh, information. So it's about tuning your, this model towards uh, a more realistic approach. So you could define any type of resource. We can define a resource to perform any, any, any aspect that you believe could be impacted by your application. So, on, so here's an implementer of that. That's how the file count resource was created. Uh, we have an ID. We have a start method, which initially performs an availability check. Let's make sure that you already have that information, because right after start, you can start querying for, for the availability. And then you create a, a routine to perform the collection which is on the upper right corner block there. And on the check available, that's a simple direct observation. I'm going to the disk and reading the directory. And that is an expensive operation. So therefore, my parameter here, when you start, you have a heartbeat milliseconds integer that will allow you to define your polling frequency. So this is how the is available works. Very straightforward. At that point, you have a state that is already known. It's an estimated state for your average use case situation. And, and the get process is returning a percentage between that and your limit. So. This is how you can visualize a way to create a new resource in this, in this mode. You will pass an ID, and your resource can, in this case, obviously, we're dealing with directories, so you can implement additional, um, additional properties that are uh, applicable. So whatever you need for defining your resource will be passed over there. But the only required, uh, required uh, property is the ID. So then you add a resource to a resource manager, and 
for the consumer point of view, this is actually how you start using that. This is your dispatcher. How do you understand if your resource is available? You will deal with a resource manager, and you will call these available method, passing the identification of your resource. So here you can see that there is an approach to have a collection of resources managed by a resource manager, and that's your entry point to define and to consume. What other resources I can do? Um, well, this is one that is actually a, a, a very uh, potential case for many situations. You are interacting with an application server externally, and you want to make sure that the CPU limit does not exceed a certain percentage. Because you know you are responsible for that increasing in, in impact. So in that approach, your resource interface can be observing that specific CPU level of your application server process. Other resources we can work with uh, limit the, the um, average CPU of a specific process. That's the previous example. The system or a specific process memory, network latency, application performance through and, and throughput, and external system events, which could be of any sort. It could be a failed system, which is notifying you, stop performing backups. Uh, there is a failure that we are working with. There's no need for you to be computing that task for now. So you can be very creative, but you are creating hooks to real events around you that are part of what provides you re uh, all the, the, the needed requirements for your application to operate, and, that, and, it, and you should coexist in a non-invasive way. So we want to also visualize resources. So in my specific use case, um, of implementation. I created a, a, a way to visualize a graph where for every resource that I define in my application, like here we have the file limit resource, I can see all the attempts to obtain um, a resource. So when I'm asking if it is available and how many times it failed. So here I have an example where I have a failure of about 20,000 and I succeeded just 11 times. Well, basically, in this case, the directory got full, and nothing could be written to it anymore. So it protected me from that. But that allows me to have a statistical view of how I can tune up my application, how I can improve that resource capacity, and, and be able to coexist. So only creating a, a mechanism to perform that is not sufficient. It's very important to collect statistics and to analyze them. So the, what we see there on the, on the ends, on the success and failed endpoints of the graph, is a file tasker function, which is my consumer. So you would actually, if you had different consumers of resources, you would see the graph expanded towards that. It would become a more elaborated graph, but you would be able to see which are, which are the consumers that are having more failures than others. So, uh, so resource stats are, is basically another area of the architecture that is attached to the resource manager. So the sequence goes from that. The consumer requests a resource. On the second stage, the resource manager will observe the resource. And on the third stage, you are already collecting the statistics of that result. So in that code block there, as you see, the if available is already updating a specific um, metric. So integrated into this, I implemented a get caller method uh, using runtime callers. And the get caller could be embedded also on the set itself as far as you have a callers to level four. So you have a stage of 
stack interaction further. But anyway, that's a very, very cool and handy thing to do at runtime. So this is a, a set of visualizations as well that I implemented, um, allowing me to visualize various aspects of the stack. Something that I really hate to see, of course, is the SEM acquire. That's a deadlock. And it allows me through here to directly monitor that in real time in the application. So to achieve this graph, um, transitioning through the pprof uh, package and obtaining that information and parsing that. Uh, the output is only textual, but uh, you, you would be able to easily parse that information and, and generate a, a, a dynamic trace like this. We can see channels receiving, we would see all the goroutines we have, and we would also be able to expand this graph and make it more elaborated, uh, showing the relationship of your goroutines, your resource managers, your resource stats, and uh, the, the specific uh, dispatchers. So summarizing, we want to work towards vertical scalability. And for us, that's pretty easy. But first consider what are your resources. So do not consider CPU as your only problem or memory. Horizontal scaling, when you are aiming for massive scalability. You, you are aiming for something that can be expanded with little effort uh, as your demand increases. And that's something you can do immediately from a vertical scalability implementation. Define a resource library. Find out around, around your implementations what are your resources, what is causing a potential problem in bottlenecks, and how you want to collaborate in a more uh, in non-invasive fashion with other systems. React through code. You have now, through uh, a similar implementation like this, the ability to be dynamically adjustable. You can elastically define how you are going to uh, compute your, your, your tasks. And collect, analyze statistics. And it's not too difficult, but to visualize what is actually happening in your system is a very powerful tool. Um, I often presented graphs of various complex clusters to, to engineers who were involved in that implementation from day one. And it, they're, they're, they were absolutely amazed to see a graph and, 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 and be able to finally understand how, what is the relationship of their actions and their implementations and their changes towards the, the har harmony that you could see behind the graph. I'll finish with this quote, um, which is still very applicable today, I believe. And thank you very much. So, um, yes. Can I take a question? Absolutely. Yep. Yes, uh, questions are very welcome. Keep in mind, this is a very complex topic. So, if we are talking about threads and OS threads. But. Um, I've got a question on the topic of checking the availability of your resources. Uh, could it be an option to um, make the uh, frequency with which you check the availability of your uh, resources uh, on, um, uh, let's say, the availability of the resource? I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. Yes. Uh, if you have um, uh, your, uh, your 100 files that you are writing, your temp directory, maybe 
it's not necessary if you at your last check you well there's still 95 available uh, to do it as often as if you at your last check that there were only five right it is absolutely possible yes you could make it adaptable to your last results and so for instance if you have a situation where on your very first availability check where you have a negative outcome you could adjust your polling frequency uh, let's say through a reverse exponential approach where you will observe if that has sufficiently gave, given more accuracy for your requests but uh, but the but from initial calculation, it's, it's fairly simple to examine the frequency of changes in your statistical point of view, in, in your yeah. statistical data, and find out what is the, the optimum approach where if eventually you reach 110, you still say, that's okay. I uh -huh. define 100 thinking that 120 is the worst case scenario, and your statistical information will never reach there during that poly frequency. Okay. But adjustability is something you can implement or refine. That's a, that's a, a very good perspective. Thank you. Uh, so my question is that uh, today we use Docker and containers and a lot of other things. So the scope of my Go process is within that container. How do we monitor the external resources? Because I don't have the access to those kind of things. So for example, CPU, in, in my Go process, I can see I have 100% CPU, but from outside, yeah. it could be like 5%. Um, I think LXC containers, uh, if you are a root on the host side, you can still reach the Slack proc directory and observe where is your Docker container ending up to, and so on. Uh, from a container point of view, I actually do not know what's the relationship of the operating system threads will actually be where the, the threads that containers are running on. But you can find out that from the host point of view. So there is a subdirectory under slash proc that will lead you to the container, actually. OK, thank you for your questions. Let's have another round of applause for Guido. Thank you. <laughs>